Assalamu alaikum and welcome to Muslim Female Leaders. Uh, today we have Rana Hussain with us um, and we've been looking at um, interviewing her to discuss a little bit about her latest exciting position with Collingwood FC. Now, firstly, Rana, can you tell us a bit about yourself as an Australian Muslim woman? And also, I know we probably need another segment entirely to tell us about your family and your background, but tell us a little bit about your background. Sure. Uh, I was born here in Melbourne, uh, on Wurundjeri land uh, in 1986. And uh, my parents arrived in Australia in the early 70s from Hyderabad, India. So they came over as skilled migrants uh, and um, both doctors. Um, it was an interesting time for them to come to Australia because the white Australia policy had just been dismantled. Um, and so politically and from a race perspective, it was a really, it was a period of transition actually for the country. Um, but they came as skilled migrants. And I think, you know, if I'm remembering correctly, they were planning to stay here for too long, maybe five years. But um, once they started to have kids and, and set up foundations here, they, they, you know, found that it was home. And so um, I grew up in Essendon um, with two older sisters and a brother. Uh, we very much lived a Muslim and Indian life, I guess, at home. Um, my parents always prioritised Islam from an identity point of view for us. Uh, that we were Indian was important and definitely added so much to our culture and our lifestyle. But um, they always uh, instilled in us the idea that we were Muslims first. Um, and that our faith was the core of who we are. And then after that, we were Australian and we were Indian. And they really implored us to take the parts of being Australian and take the parts of being Indian that were good, um, but to really kind of hold, hold fast to um, our Islam, really. And so we um, had that, you know, that was the kind of home upbringing. And then my sisters and I, my brother to a different school, but my sisters and I um, went to a private girls school from kinder to year 12. And so that was its own really um, nurturing and small community environment that was um, really very positive. I have um, great memories of my schooling life. It was a small school in Essendon um, and I mean I was the youngest of the, the three of us so I probably started school with a lot of confidence going there because I'd already been there and I felt like I knew the place and I knew what school was about and that school was about. Um, so we had a really lovely kind of I had a really lovely upbringing in that I had this Western Australian environment that I felt like I belonged to and then Muslim and Indian cultural environment at home that I felt like I belonged to. So, um, you know, looking back now is quite a happy existence. But of course, as we all know, being kids of migrants or migrants ourselves, there's always tension in that too, in shaping who we are and how we see ourselves. So I definitely had those periods, but, um, you know, it was a very um, privileged existence. It's interesting how you mentioned that the original thought was to come out here for five years or for a short amount of time. And that is something that I hear all the time. The migrants always intended to come out here for two years, three years, five years. No one really expected to stay here for 30 years or you know, 40 years, however long now um, most of the migrants have been here for. Now, I wanted to ask you a little bit about your current position at Richmond Footy Club. Tell us a bit about your role there. Yeah, I, um, although I'm just about to finish up and move on to some other things, but um, for the last four or five years, I've been working at the Richmond Footy Club as the diversity and inclusion lead there. I started there, so I um, studied a Bachelor of Creative Arts out of high school and I did a Master's of Social Work and I went into school counselling actually and I worked at an Islamic school um, and I really thought that that would be the path that I'd go down. 
Um, and I was really interested in mental health and the experiences of young people. And then I started to reflect on my own experiences and things like belonging and, um, you know, being a different type of Australian just kept cropping up. And I've always been a footy fan. And so I um, just became more and more interested in how does football interact with who we you know, how we see ourselves and, and what about those of us who are from different backgrounds? How do we interact with football and do we see ourselves in the game? Um, and so I just started to get more and more involved and eventually, you know, realised I had a really um, deep love and passion for the sport, but also representation in the sport and in media and seeing um, different voices, diverse voices in the media and in sport. And so... I decided to, you know, take a risk and leave my job as a school counsellor and um, Richmond were looking for somebody to come in and do some kind of multicultural work for them. And so I just, I dived into the deep end there and um, from there just kind of carved out a space for myself. And um, ever since things have just kind of exploded for me in that way. So at the club, I look after you know, what does belonging mean? What does it mean to belong at Richmond and in football? And particularly, is the club inclusive of different types of communities? So, you know, can a Muslim walk in and be who they are and not change, but still be part of the Richmond Footy Club? Can people with disabilities walk into the, or, you know, come into the club and feel like they can belong to? So it's those kinds of conversations that I've been leading for the club. And that's led me to now, do a lot of consulting for other organisations, um, including Ben Simmons, the basketballer, the NBA basketballer, um, other, you know, sporting codes, Cricket Australia. And uh, recently I've just been appointed to the Collingwood Anti-Racism Advisory Committee. So that will be a huge piece of work that I'm about to take on. It'll take, you know, keep me busy for the next year or so, but um, that will really look at what is going on at Collingwood and how they can start to repair. Speaking of Collingwood and your new appointed role, I, uh, my husband is a very diehard fan of Collingwood and I remember uh -huh. in 2010, that was the most blessed year for him because uh, we had our, uh, our first child and we also won the Premiership Cup that year in 2010. Uh, so he's, he's been a diehard fan and uh, we often reflect on, on how that, that came about and he always tells me that when he was younger, um, he used to go to matches with his dad. And I feel that um, having an inclusive platform, it offers so much opportunity uh, for more families to engage with footy because it's such a culture, it's such a, it's such a big part of um, people's upbringings um, given the opportunity. Now, you mentioned, you touched on it lightly, but there was a Do Better report and a number of prominent community leaders were appointed to the Anti-Racism Advisory Committee. And you're one of those committee members, uh, as well as, I believe, Tasneem Chopra from the Muslim community, who's a part of that um, committee. Can you tell us a little bit about, um, more about what are some of the things that you'd like to see moving forward change at the Collingwood Football Club? Yeah, I think so. The purpose of that group is to really implement the recommendations that came out of that report. So Collingwood um, commissioned this report to really investigate what what racism looked like in and around the club. And the club has historical incidences of racism, you know, from the beginning of the game through till today, and and really looked at the processes of the club has at the moment to manage those situations and whether the club is capable of managing incidences of racism. Um, and so, you know, our job will be to implement a lot of those recommendations and advise the club on how to, how they actually can do better, what would that would look like. Um, and it's not just a Collingwood problem, it's a problem for the entire country and we see it across the Football League, but it, it is everywhere, racism um, in different forms. And so I guess for me, you know, what I hope for the AFL industry is that we start to see different types of people um, from the leadership down, you know, in the organisations in the league itself. Um, 
with real power, with legitimate power um, that can affect change and bring in different perspectives, perspectives around what it feels like to be on the outer of football or on the outer of mainstream society. Uh, that's sort of what I hope to kind of leave behind when I do leave the industry one day. Um, lots of different types of people who can contribute to making the game better. Uh, and then from a, you know, from a racism itself point of view, I think some real, really strong education around what racism looks like when it's not the one-to-one -one conversation, because we can all recognise a harsh word said or a racist comment. What we don't recognise so readily is when our systems and our structures exclude people. Um, you know, but as Muslims and as people, migrant communities, we know what that feels like when we feel like the odd one in the room or when we feel like there's a barrier between us and the rest of society, when there are opportunities that we feel like we can't access. So those are the things I wanted to try and break down and it's going to be a lot of work, but hopefully we, we do something meaningful there. Now, as, a, as an Australian Muslim woman, um, and also in general, have you faced any particular obstacles um, on your journey to where you are now? Um, I mean, undoubtedly, yes. And sometimes I think I don't even know when I have faced them. They just are because it's, that's just my experience. I think, you know, the barriers can often be we get relegated to parts of society. So it's not that anybody is ever mean to me face to face or um, refuses me opportunities, but I often find that people don't consider me, you know, I've been doing a lot more media now. And up until recently, you know, when I used to say, I wanna get on camera, I wanna be a broadcaster, people are surprised by that because they've never really seen a hijabi woman on camera leading or, or hosting um, or having ideas and grappling with ideas. And so it was, it's just about, you know, the barriers for me is just getting people to think a little bit outside what they know and what they expect of me when they see me. So, you know, I, I'm very aware that when I walk into a room, the way I look brings there are a lot of assumptions made about who I am before I even, you know, tell them a little bit about myself. And often it's things like people assume that I've come from a really tough background. They assume that I might be, you know, not that wealthy. Um, they, you know, sometimes they think that I might not be that educated. And when they hear I've got a master's, they hear um, that my parents are doctors, you know, they, they get, uh, they, they're happy about it, but they just go, oh, okay. I wasn't expecting that from you. So I think it's that's the stereotypes that we all deal with. Um, you just are constantly breaking those down for people. But the flip side of that is that I've seen a change in that people now want different voices. So what used to feel like a barrier or something that was at arm's length is now so much closer and people want to hear different types of experience. They want to hear from different types of Australians. And that's what I used to think would hold me back is now, you know, my selling point or what is getting me through doors because people see me as a point of difference and I'm getting more opportunities because of that. So my advice to anyone who feels on the outer is to use that, use your point of difference to get ahead if that's what you want. That was actually my next question to you. So what advice would you give to um, Muslim women, young Muslim women, particularly of colour, um, that are looking to pursue a position in leadership, in, on boards, um, in sports? What advice would you like to give? I mean, the, the biggest piece of advice, and I have to give it to myself before I give you say it to anyone else, is to hold on to your faith. Um, to really hold that close to you and make that your the thing that is the center of everything you do because that will you can't lose in that um, the opportunities might come and go but if that's what you're holding on to then you will always win the day uh, and you can hold your head high because you know what's driving you and you know you have that inner compass um, aside from that though I would say 
don't think that you don't belong because you do. You have every right to. And you might look different, sound different, be different, but that doesn't make you lesser. It just makes you different. And actually, you know, that could potentially be your strength and the thing that you can leverage. And then the other thing I would say is uh, make sure you have a good circle of people who get you, who understand you, who know who you are and who um, whose experiences mirror yours because the world can sometimes feel really isolating if you're the only one in the room who's a little bit different. Um, and especially for me, you know, that's been my experience going to really male dominated industries um, and really white industries. Um, and so it's, I've realized no matter how well meaning people are in those spaces, they don't know what it's like to be Muslim and they don't know what it's like to be Muslim in this country. So I really rely on my family to have that kind of connection just back to who I am, my identity, a safe space for me to turn to when I need to kind of re recharge. Um, so, you know, don't ever lose sight of those people in your life that really support you without any agenda. That's really beautiful. There seems to be a consistent theme around um, having your faith and having a, a close and reliable support network, your family, your friends. I hear this consistently with very successful um, female Muslim leaders. Um, were there any closing remarks you'd like to make? Um, I just want to thank my parents for their guidance and for setting me up. You know, Alhamdulillah, I was blessed with beautiful parents and uh it's their, you know, upbringing that's given me the tools I needed to get to where I am. And, um, you know, I see myself even in my day to day when I'm doing different things, um, I see their input. I can see, you know, I remind, I think, oh my gosh, I sound like my dad now, or this is how my mum would do it. And sometimes I'm completely different too, and that's fine. But I can see the building blocks now. What they gave me is kind of coming into fruition. And so, you know, my mother mother uh, is still a working woman and um, she kind of showed me what strength it takes to do all of this. Now, you know, she did so much that I don't think I could ever match, but um, she kind of showed me what strength looks like. Um, and I've, so I've learned a lot from her. So, I mean just valuing them is really important to me. It sounds to me like your mother was really leading by example and you followed in her footsteps. Thank you so much for joining us today, Rana Hussain, uh, who is on the advisory committee, the anti-racism advisory committee for Collingwood Football Club. Thank you for sharing your story today with us. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Wa alaikum assalam.